Welcome to another episode of Auto Mundial, where this week we're taking a look at an all-new electric car from Dacia. Audi's latest super saloon takes on the BMW M5, while we also have the new Chevrolet Trailblazer, as well as an AMG-tuned crossover from Mercedes. And in this week's Deep Drive, we review the all-new Toyota Yaris. The merger between two of Europe's biggest car manufacturing groups, PSA and FCA, has been finalised, creating the world's fourth biggest car company in the process. Carlos Tavares, the former boss of PSA, will run the newly formed company known as Stellantis. The brands under the new company include Fiat, Peugeot, Citroën, Vauxhall, Alfa Romeo and Lancia in Europe, while also adopting Chrysler, Jeep and Ram over in North America. With annual production estimated at approximately 8.7 million units per year, it places Stellantis behind the Volkswagen Group, Toyota and the Renault-Nissan Alliance in terms of annual sales. As with brands under the VW Group, we can expect lots of parts and platform sharing between Stellantis brands and maybe even a return to the US market for some of the European marks. It seems that Japanese and Korean manufacturers have been dominating the crossover class recently, so is there room for an all-new American alternative? Well, this is the all-new Chevrolet Trailblazer, and its aim is to steal sales from Mazda, Kia and Hyundai in the US market. With prices starting at just under $20,000, the entry-level car is pretty basic, making do with just one colour option and steel wheels rather than alloys. Spend an extra few thousand though and the Trailblazer becomes a real rival to the likes of the Hyundai Venue and Kia Seltos, with some sportier styling tweaks and more equipment. There are two engines to choose from, both turbocharged three cylinders. The cheaper option is a 1.2, putting out 137 horsepower, while the bigger 1.3 produces 155. The smaller engined cars are front wheel drive only, while buyers of the bigger motor get the option to upgrade to all wheel drive. Although even these top spec only just get to 62 miles per hour from rest in under 10 seconds. The Trailblazer then isn't best suited to highway driving, instead feeling much more at home nipping around city streets. Its ride isn't the best in this class, but it is roomy with plenty of space for front and rear passengers. The cabin isn't quite as good looking as the rest of the car, but it is functional and well equipped with wireless smartphone charging, adaptive cruise control and a decent infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Overall though, there are better options out there. For the price of a mid-level trailblazer, you could comfortably get our favourite car in this class, the excellent Mazda CX-30. The Chevrolet may be good looking, but in this hotly contested corner of the market, that simply isn't enough. If you're after a small, fast SUV, there are currently plenty to choose from. There's the Ford Puma ST, the Audi SQ2, the Mini Countryman JCW, we could go on. And as much as we prefer hot hatchbacks, it seems there is a big market for these souped up crossovers. And now, there's a new one. This is the Mercedes-AMG GLA 35, and it follows a familiar recipe. Like the 300 horsepower 2.0-litre Mini Countryman, and the 300 horsepower 2.0-litre Audi SQ2, and the 300 horsepower 2.0-litre Volkswagen T-Roc R, the GLA gets, you guessed it, a 300 horsepower 2.0-litre engine, good for 0 to 62 miles per hour in 5.1 seconds.
but where the Mercedes does stand out is its styling. As we said when we first saw the new GLA early this year, it's a very good-looking car. Where the old model just appeared to be an A-Class on stilts, much more effort has been put into this new car to help it stand out from the hatchback on which it's based. It has a much more SUV-like stance. Its whole body is taller than an A-Class, with a much higher roofline. The wheelbase is shorter than the old cars too, making it look more squat and purposeful. It gets AMG's signature Pana Americana grille at the front, sitting above a wider intake in the bumper. 19-inch wheels come as standard, with these massive 21s an option that's probably best left alone. The interior is a cut above the rest in this class too, with top-spec cars getting the wonderful full-size infotainment screens and plenty of leather and aluminium. The 35, then, is exactly what we were expecting. A well-appointed, quick crossover to rival the myriad of others in this class. However, the 35 isn't the only GLA that AMG has worked its magic on. This is the GLA 45S, and it makes all the other quick crossovers seem a little bit half-hearted. The body is festooned with aero bits like the canyards on the front bumper and that less than subtle rear spoiler helping it to stand out from the lesser 35 model. It also gets four Chasmel tailpipes, a bigger splitter and diffuser, huge alloys and some bright red brake calipers. Inside it gets some sporty carbon fibre trim and a pair of body hugging seats. It certainly looks the part then, but it is under the bonnet where the 45 really stands out. Again, it uses a turbocharged 2-litre, but this time it's been tuned all the way up to 415 brake horsepower, making this and the A45S hot hatch on which it's based the most powerful four-cylinder cars you can buy. As a result of this insane amount of power, the little crossover launches itself from a standstill to 62 miles per hour in less than four and a half seconds, onto a limited top speed of 155. However, all this performance does come at a cost. While cheaper versions will be available in certain markets, in the UK, the GLA 45S starts at almost £59,000, with expensive options like the aero package and big wheels, meaning you can spend well over £70,000. That puts it in line with some much bigger competition, cars like the Alfa Romeo Stelvio Quadrifoglio and the Porsche Macan Turbo. In conclusion then, the GLA 45S is not a sensible purchase, especially when the regular A45 is cheaper and quicker. We do like it though, if only for its sheer daftness. The 35 though seems like a much better buy. It's still very fast, but it's much better value. And now an Auto Mundial deep drive as we take an in-depth look at the all-new Toyota Yaris. The Toyota Yaris, a fuss-free small car long famed for its reliability and rock-bottom running costs, if little else. It was a car best suited to slow city driving, allowing you to sit pretty in the knowledge that every time you came to a stop, its hybrid system would cut the engine, saving fuel and protecting the planet. The hybrid system was once a USP for the Yaris, but now others, like the latest Renault Clio and new Honda Jazz, have joined the fold, meaning the Toyota needs to smarten up its act. Given the company's success with the new Toyota Corolla and the Prius, we've high hopes that this stereotype Super Mini has finally come of age. It even looks quite cool. I mean, look at it. Nice squat planted appearance, and in some ways, it's even a bit sporty. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This new Yaris is going to have to pull out all the stops if it's going to topple class favourites like the Ford Fiesta, the Volkswagen Polo, and the Renault Clio. 
this new fourth generation Yaris certainly has the right ingredients to make it a success in the small car market. While most rivals are only just starting to dabble in mild hybrid assistance, a small electrical motor designed to reduce load on the engine, Toyota plows on with its full hybrid system, which it claims will allow owners to do 50% of urban journeys purely on electricity. All this technology comes at a price, however, with even basic models costing almost £20,000. And it doesn't really matter which version you go for because every model gets a touchscreen infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, which is a great thing because it allows you to navigate around Toyota's usually clunky infotainment system. Elsewhere, you get a reversing camera, climate control, and a suite of the latest safety kit. In addition to that touchscreen infotainment system and reversing camera, base icon models get alloy wheels, automatic lights and wipers, and a height adjustable driver's seat. There are a number of option packs, but just for a few extra quid a month, you can upgrade to design trim, bringing a slightly larger screen, LED lights and privacy glass, while dynamic cars like ours feature 17 inch wheels, a JBL eight speaker stereo, synthetic leather sports seats, dual zone climate control, and keyless entry. If you prefer a more luxurious take on the Yaris formula, Excel switches some of the dynamic model's dark trim for lighter grey fabric, while also adding some satin chrome trim to the exterior. After the break, part two of our Yaris Deep Drive, as well as a new EV from Dacia and the Audi RS7. Still to come, Audi's RS7 versus the BMW M5. But first, part two of our Toyota Yaris Deep Drive. There is only one engine available to UK-based Yaris buyers. While other markets get a non-hybrid 1.0-litre petrol, the only option here is the super frugal 1.5 hybrid. Toyota originally touted as much as 105 miles to the gallon, but since launch the maker has published a much more realistic 68.9 mpg figure with CO2 emissions of less than 100 grams per kilometre. While that means class leading company car tax, it can't compete with the pure electric Renault Zoe in this regard. All models come with a 5 year 100,000 mile warranty, a 5 star Euro NCAP rating and driver power data to make its rivals weep. Toyota owners tend to be a very happy bunch. The Yaris's engine produces a total of 114 brake horsepower, which means it should be good enough to get from 0-62 miles an hour in less than 10 seconds, which, in most circumstances, should be enough for super mini buyers. The electrical assistance blends in nicely and makes it feel alert off the line, which really helps when nipping in and out of gaps in traffic. For many buyers in this area of the market, practicality is just as important as a lengthy kit list and in this area the Yaris falls ever so slightly short. In here you've got 281 litres to play with which is pretty much within touching distance of the Ford Fiesta but a little bit short of class leaders like the Volkswagen Polo and the Renault Clio. But of course this being a hybrid rather than a fully electric car means there are no cables to contend with. This new Yaris on paper at least has all the ingredients to make it one of the best small cars money can buy. And you know what? It very nearly nails it. It's perhaps not quite as big or as spacious inside as some of its rivals, but on the flip side, you get class leading running costs, strong kit list, and a driving experience that's very much on par with cars in this class. No longer a tax busting one trick pony, this new Yaris is back at its best. While there are now plenty of expensive premium EVs to choose from, cheap electric cars are still fairly thin on the ground. Even a basic Volkswagen E-Up or Renault Zoe will cost well over £20,000 before any government grants. Now though, Dacia is set to spice things up with this, the Spring. Closely related to the Indian market Renault Quid, the Spring is set to be Europe's cheapest electric car when it goes on sale later this year. 
While it may have SUV design cues like the high suspension and chunky bumpers, this is very much a city car with dinky proportions. In fact, it's only a little bit bigger than the VW Up, despite its impressive 300-litre boot. Inside, it's predictably basic, with swathes of black plastic lifted by bits of brightly coloured trim. But this is what has made Dacia so popular. It's no-nonsense approach to car building, leaving out the bits you don't really need in the pursuit of good value. You can spec an optional infotainment screen though, complete with CarPlay and Android Auto, as well as air conditioning, electric door mirrors, and even a reversing camera if you're feeling particularly flush. Powering the spring is a 43 brake horsepower electric motor paired up to a 26.8 kilowatt hour battery. That may sound akin to the setup on an old milk float, but it will get the plucky Dacia up to a heady 78 miles per hour. So while the spring won't be best suited to long distances, it'll be great for people who do all their driving in the city. It can be charged at 80% in just under an hour from a 30 kilowatt charger, and it has a turning circle of just 4.8 meters. While there are undoubtedly more rounded EV options out there, we think it will be a while until there's another one out there for the price of a petrol super mini. Mercedes and BMW are famous for their super saloons. The M5 and E63 pair supercar performance with executive saloon styling and practicality. However, if you want Audi's equivalent, the RS6, you have to settle for an estate. Now though, Audi has compromised to those who don't need the extra boot space with this, a four-door coupe called the RS7 Sportback. Using the same drivetrain as the mighty new RS6 Avant, the Sportback clothes it in a sleek, curvaceous body. Like the RS6, it has wide wheels and a gaping grille. But to our eyes at least, it doesn't look quite as aggressive as the estate car. Either way, this is still a great looking car. The low roofline sweeps down to a tapered rear end, putting forward a convincing case for four-door coupes. It stands out nicely from regular A7s too, with bigger intakes, enormous exhaust pipes and a distinct lack of chrome trim. There are changes inside too, with some sports seats and countless RS badges reminding you that you're in something a bit special. The retro rev counter on the digital display is reminiscent of the original Quattro, although the less nostalgic among you can change it to a regular analog style dial. Making use of the RS6's 4 litre twin turbo V8, the Sportback pumps out a mighty 592 brake horsepower. It incongruously features a 48-volt mild hybrid system which not only improves fuel economy but also compensates for turbo lag, meaning you have more grunt more of the time. Other kit includes a new 8-speed auto box, a clever adaptive differential which can send up to 85% of the power to the rear wheels and some active anti-roll suspension, again boosted by the hybrid system. 0-62 miles per hour is handled in just 3.6 seconds and it'll keep on going all the way up to a limited top speed of 189. In the corners it handles its bulk with ease, with the air suspension and four-wheel steering making it uncannily stable at high speeds. But should you take the RS7 over the BMW? While it may look a bit more sensible thanks to its traditional saloon car body style, make no mistake, the M5 competition is a real supercar slayer.
With 616 brake horsepower on tap and four-wheel drive, the 4.4-litre V8 saloon can hit 62 miles per hour in just 3.3 seconds on its way up to 190 mph. And while the M5 has evolved to be so powerful that drive needs to go to all four wheels, it'll still let you hang the back end out like a proper M car. The competition model gets some revised stiffer suspension, making it hard to believe that you're driving a heavy four-door saloon as you thread your way through corners with the agility of a small sports car. To be honest, Audi's RS cars have never really been able to match BMWs for sheer driving pleasure. But the big power and its ability to stick to the road like glue in all weathers make the RS7 a deeply appealing car. Join us again next week on Auto Mundial as we look at the Porsche Panamera Sport Turismo.